Welcome. I'm Linda Greenhouse. I'm the president of the APS. And it's my pleasure to help you kick this off. Uh, Patrick has asked me to just give a brief couple of points about the American Philosophical Society for those of you who are new to us. Uh, for those of you who were here at the 4 o'clock session or earlier, you've, you've heard this, but I'll be quick and just remind people that the APS was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. Uh, the idea being to bring people together of substantial accomplishment for the purpose of advancing knowledge, promoting useful knowledge, as Franklin said. And so following the instructions of, the, of our founder, we hold meetings of members that showcase cutting edge thinking and research. We provide over a million and a half dollars a year in grants, primarily to young scholars for whom a little bit of a grant, especially a research field grant, can go a long way. We run a library, which I hope some of you have had a chance to see, or if you came at 4 o'clock, you see an exciting new project that's coming out of the library. And we operate the oldest continuing press, public, scholarly publication program uh, in the country. Uh, as you heard earlier, if you were here before, uh, we cannot show you the museum, which has a wonderful new Franklin scientist exhibit up now. But uh, hopefully, you'll be able to get back while that's, while that's still there. So in welcoming you to this conference, I'll, I want to make two points or say that the conference serves two purposes. One is to mark the opening, which should have been marked a year ago, but we couldn't get together then, of the David Center for the American Revolution at the APS. This is a collaboration between the APS and the David Library of the American Revolution. It's very exciting to bring these two organizations together at this moment. The David Center will encourage greater research into the era of the American founding, uh, will develop programming for all kinds of audiences to advance greater knowledge about that era and its significance. The Davis Center offers a wide range of new resources for us, new fellowships for scholars at all stages, more digitized content to increase access for researchers around the world and for use in classrooms, there will be lectures for the general public and workshops for students and teachers. So I want to acknowledge there are some of the uh, board members for the David Library who are here uh, with us today. Jim Links, who's the president. Uh, Yvette Taylor, uh, Brendan McConville, and then online, uh, Francine Stone, another uh, board member, Norval Reese, and Tina Packer are unable to attend uh, to be with us now. The second reason, of course, for us to be together now is to convene the conversation that's going to last until 2026. I'm old enough to remember 1976. And, and I remember watching from the top floor of the World Trade Center, uh, the tall ships come into New York Harbor. And what did not happen in 1976 is what Patrick and those who are, have worked on this conference have initiated starting today, which is thinking about the various meanings of independence. I think in 1976, that thought wouldn't even have occurred to people. There was one triumphant, one-dimensional meaning, and we're here today to start looking much deeper uh, in, into that question. So this conference marks the start. We're bringing together scholars and thought leaders, leaders of cultural institutions, museums, and libraries to identify some of the core issues that we ought to be thinking about in the run-up to 2026. So this keynote is really meant to start those discussions. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the panelists for our keynote panel, if they want to come up and take their seats. Um, this would be a good time to do it. And I don't actually. <laughs> I don't actually know any of our panelists, and the name tags are not visible to me from behind. So I'll just introduce them, and they can raise their hands. Although I think by, 
process of elimination, I see Dr. <laughs> Dr. Scott Stevenson uh, on the, my far right there, uh, whose broad public library experience spans nearly three decades and has been marked by public and professional acclaim for his creative and innovative approaches to engaging audiences. He's developed and collaborated on exhibits, films, interpretive programs for numerous historical sites and organizations, including Colonial Williamsburg, the Smithsonian, the Canadian War Museum, the National Park Service, George Washington's Mount, Mer Mount Vernon, the Heinz History Center, and the Museum of the Cherokee Indian. He is currently president and CEO of the Museum of the American Revolution, just across the park there, uh, which he has ser he's served in that role since 2018, he's been affiliated with the organization, the founding of that museum, since 2007. Um, I'll next introduce Anthea Hartig. Raise your hand, okay. Uh, thank you. Um, who's director of one of my favorite museums, the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. She's the first woman to hold that position since the museum opened in 1964, and she oversees more than 250 employees there, a budget of $40 million, a collection that includes 1.8 million fascinating objects and more than three shelf miles of archives. She's an award-winning public historian and expert on cultural heritage, dedicated to making the nation's richly diverse history accessible and relevant. And, let me find my next, ah, Christy Coleman, by the process of elimination, you don't have to raise your hand, uh, has served as the chief executive officer of some of the nation's most prominent museums. She's a tireless advocate for the power of museums, for narrative correction, diversity, and inclusiveness. She's an innovator and leader in the museum field, having held leadership roles at Colonial Williamsburg, the Charles Wright Museum of African American History, the American Civil War Museum, and she's now the executive director of the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation. I'll just say, this is not in my script, but I remember as about an eight-year-old going with my parents to Jamestown. And I didn't know much, but I saw these two water fountains, white and colored. And I said to my parents, I grew up in Connecticut, I said, what is that? I couldn't understand it. And they tried but probably really couldn't explain it. And that has stuck in my mind as a key moment in my own uh, understanding of the uh, craziness and sorrow of our history. So when I saw that that was one of your credentials, it just occurred to me to mention that. She's written numerous articles. She's an accomplished screenwriter, public speaker, and has appeared on several national news and history programs. And is the recipient of numerous awards for her decades of impact. So with those introductions, I will turn this over to the Society's librarian, Patrick Spiro, who will moderate this discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you, Linda. And uh, thank you all for coming. I have to say it's uh, both strange and exhilarating to see so many people in this room after two years. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> And what's funny is I was sitting up here, I was you know, looking forward to getting the crowd interaction and getting the feedback from the crowd, but in some ways it still feels like Zoom, where you can't read anybody's face, they all have masks on, you don't know if they're laughing at your jokes. <laughs> People usually don't laugh at my jokes, so I'm used to it. <laughs> and I also want to welcome everybody uh, who's streaming online. I want to assure all those online that to ask questions, ask your questions, we have a way to have those questions filtered to us, and we will be taking questions from those online. So feel as if you're a full participant in in this conversation. Um, so thank you uh, also, all of you, to make the trip up here and uh, have a discussion. Um, and we want to discuss, as Linda mentioned, the, the meanings of independence, uh, especially with an eye towards 2026. Um, we are five years out from the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence and, and the year that marked American independence as, as a nation. And I'm thrilled to be able to talk to all of you to get your perspectives as public historians, as leaders of cultural inst uh, institutions, as scholars, as thought leaders uh, about this. And I can't wait to hear from the audience afterwards. We're going to talk for maybe about 30 minutes and then open it up to everybody in the audience. Um, so I wanted to uh, begin with what might be a bit of an unfair question. Um, <laughs> and that's when, and I know you're sitting next to me, so you're going to go first. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, and that is, when you think about the Declaration of Independence yourself, what is the first word that comes to mind to describe it? First word to, to describe it. Yeah. I didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just uh, making sure. Buying time. <laughs> Um, the first word that comes to mind when I think about the Declaration of Independence is transformative. I know that sounds trite, but it's not transformative necessarily because of w what they meant, but transformative in that how people heard it. Guessing we're going down the line. <laughs> um, First word that comes to mind is unfinished. That it has both um, such resonance, um, such mythology, and um, and the ideals embodied in it have such you know such a long way to go. I think to actually achieve their fullness. Maybe transformative and unfinished. Over to you, you. guys. <laughs> got to use all the good stuff. <laughs> uh, so I was actually, I had a long drive in the car today, so I listened to uh, the recommendation of our chief historian, Phil Mead, um, a talk that Danielle Allen did at the Library of Congress back in 2015 about her book, Our Declaration. And I actually, what it, when she was talking about her students, not just her Knight students, but her Ivy League students, one of the things that struck me is how few people have actually read the entire thing. So I think I'm going to say confusing because I actually think uh, kind of working in the public history space and interacting with all of our various publics, um, it's more common to encounter people who have opinions about it, but less common for those who actually really understand what it was, what are the parts of it, what's the rhythm, uh, what's its uh, structure, and what its relationship to the Constitution is. All still uh, long journeys that we hopefully together will make some That's progress great. in the next couple of years. So, so I wanted to uh, follow this, I guess, a, a little bit. And, and as museum professionals or leaders of cultural institutions or, or historians, that one word, how would you, if you're curating an exhibition, interpret that word? What are some of the events, the themes, the events, the people, the, the stories, um, to really capture, to interpret that, that word that, that you just used? And this time I'll start with Scott, I'll be fair. <laughs> well, I think um, for me that, that insight actually drove a lot of the way we've organized the Museum of the American Revolution. I hope, I'm sure many of you have visited, but if you haven't, it's just a block away. And we gave you a free ticket. You don't get it on Zoom, but um, so no excuses, because I know you have two hour breaks here, because uh, I looked at the schedule. but. Um, you know, early on, I think there was, a, there was a, a drive that often comes from the marketing people that they want language to describe what you're doing. And uh, of course, you have to get donors, something we all work <laughs> with all day long, and attract uh, people who are going to be supportive. And so there's, there, was a, there was language that crept in about how this was going to be a museum that told the complete story of the American Revolution. But of course, when you start thinking about what that would actually be, that's an impossible task. And uh, actually, the late Gary Nash, who I know probably virtually no one in this room didn't interact with at some point in their uh, careers, Gary was part of our board of scholars. And I, it, it still sticks with me, like one of my most poignant memories was, this is back in 2007, where when we were grappling with this, you know, you start off with a board of scholars, you all have been part of the NEH process, and you end up with these uh, sort of pie charts of what should be in your museum, but that's not the way, you know, beautiful films are made or orchestras are written. You, know, you have to write a story, you have to cut some things out, leave other things in, elevate things. And, and Gary had this insight where he said, I'd love to, to go to a museum where you're more focused on asking questions than providing answers. And that was like a real watershed moment um, for us. And so when you go to the museum, you'll see we actually have, although it's a chronological story of you know about 1760 to the 1790s for the core of the exhibition, it's framed around questions like how did people become revolutionaries? How did the revolution survive its darkest hour? 
what was revolutionary about the war, or what kind of nation did the revolution create? And then we try to sort of expose you to evidence and different perspectives. It's very character driven. So like when we take our school kids through, you know, in those groups, there we actually stop them and say, okay, we, you know, you're gathering evidence along the way. What would you have done, or what was this character that we've given you to to think about? What would they have done in this kind of situation? And that that's been a really powerful way, I think, of um, taking some of the pressure off feeling like people need to know, you know, facts and dates and the kind of way that we were traditionally taught history. When you enter it through human experience, it becomes less confusing. Now, all of a sudden, when you've been through, uh, you know, the late colonial period and you get to the Declaration of Independence, you can start to read that document and it starts to make a little more sense uh, to you. So anyway, I think that's been our experience uh, anyway, the last couple of years. Did I talk long enough to give you a good answer? <laughs> so, um, so I mean, I, I, you know, you're broadly sketching, and thank you for that, the kind of a, a inquiry-based model of learning and educating, which I think is critical. But I think the question was to unpack our word a bit. Um, so the declaration itself has become, you know, very connected, of course, to um, the date it was, um, uh, wasn't quite ratified yet, as you know. It was actually the proceeding started on the second of July. But um, so I've I really enjoy the opportunity to go back and I listened to President Kennedy read the Declaration, and I you know read through some of the famous, um, uh, both commentary and then the real kind of piercing assessments of the Declaration and its kind of undoneness, especially, of course, the famous one um, from Frederick Douglass. But then in, in thinking about the undoneness, you know, you have this radical claim of these kind of virtues, which I think almost, you know, so many of us that kind of scribe, you know, these truths. Um, but then you also have this series of laments, right, and accusations against a tyrannical king. And we kind of forget the laments. And so I spent some more time on the laments um, because I think the unfinished part of it has got to bring forth a relevance and a resonance within people so that they understand what perhaps the, these liberties that revolutionaries around the world have fought for, and especially the subsequent revolutions, especially um, the earliest one um, on this side of the world in Haiti, um, really kind of what that meant for people. And to see relevance um, in those words, and I was struck by the, uh, we held the teachers of the year were at the museum yesterday, these amazing people from all over the country. 27 states are passing, have passed legislation um, incriminating the teaching of race, racism, slavery. And these teachers were so grateful, I think, to be in Washington and have community together and are grateful for the resources we all provide teachers. But they were really asking us what we were doing about kind of their liberty in a way, right? Mm -hmm. Their capacity to teach. And so I was thinking a lot about Gary, who's one of my mentors, mm -hmm. and one of the last conversations I had with him is that he was kind of predicting these history wars. So I do think the Declaration can be a way in as one of the quote founding documents into understanding this, you know, this really ongoing contestation um, over whose liberty, when is one's liberty at the you know, paradoxically requiring another's enslavement. Um, and so I think there's still such a richness there, and that's why I hope people think that it is undone. But again, it's their responsibility to engage with that making of, um, of understanding its perils, its promises, uh, and its paradoxes. Thanks, Chrissy. <clears throat> um, my approach would, would actually be, have some of the elements that you've heard but as I said, since my word was transformative, then it seems to me that in the public history space, we have to transform the way we consider this work. Um, especially given the fact that most of our institutions, when it comes to our collections and our archives, are woefully inadequate in terms of telling the stories of people who didn't choose to keep those things or were unable to. And so for me, if you want the Declaration to mean something, 
to really mean something and to people to interact with it and to have the same levels of transformation um, that f that pushed what all men are created equal and doubt what their creator would mean, including gender and all varieties of, of identification, then that's exactly how I would build out the exhibition. It would be contemporary. It would be oral histories. It would be conversations. It would be things that represent who we are because I say it over and over again, history has never been for the dead. It is about its usefulness in helping us navigate the world that we're in and trying to find connections to the communities we are a part of or choose to be. And if that is the case, if we really want transformation, especially in this moment yet again, where we find ourselves yet again in a situation where we are having battles about the past and who's past and claiming the things that are being claimed and denying again the things that we know as truths, then we have to stop thinking our objects and our archives are going to be the saving grace. We have to build these exhibitions and these programs where people are and what they're feeling and what they're thinking and then take them on a journey to discover, to inquire, to go deeper than their comforts. Now, um, and that's what will really transform us to a place of healthy democracy. We are not a healthy democracy. And it isn't just in the past four years. It's just, just the way it is, right? I mean, like it or not, and I know there are people who might be bristling a little bit about what I'm saying, but we are not a healthy democracy when we refuse to hear the voices and the stories or the inclusions of people who don't look like us, or who don't have what we have, or who don't speak the way we speak. They are just as American. They have just as much pride, just as much need, just as much purpose, and yet we have as we did from our founding, been a nation of oligarchs. Right? Very rich, wealthy, well-educated, white men designed a nation with some really wonderful concepts that if we're being honest, they really, only a handful of them because they, they were there. But only a handful of them actually thought more broadly than themselves when they gave those words. Right? So, you know, this transformation, this exploration of who we are in this moment and, and how we will choose to remember um, 1776, and yeah, I remember it too. I was actually there at the Bicentennial, and I was a little girl in Williamsburg, and I remember just millions of people just like wandering around with like flag shirts on, and kind of nutty, and fifers and drummers, and well, Williamsburg always has fifers and drummers, so. <laughs> Every day. Um, but, you know, and I, I, I don't remember much about it, except that the majority of the people who were there celebrating that moment definitely didn't look like me. The people who looked like me, we were in our neighborhoods. And we were celebrating and thinking about it in a completely different way. Still valuable. A battle cry, really, is how we were thinking about it, not a completed thing. Great, thank you. And that actually um, leads us to 2026, mm -hmm. I think. Um, looking back on 1976 and its, and its shortcomings, when we think about 2026, what does success actually look like? Um, you know, there are all these measurable statistics about the number of tourists, like you mentioned, coming through a city, uh, you know, the amount of revenue that maybe is produced, and all of these other things, but what is it 
that how would you all define success and what would it look like? And I don't want to hear anything about data and revenue and numbers. <laughs> and yeah, I haven't called on you first, though, so here we go. <laughs> I, th I think uh, he who started the society said it best. It's a democracy if you can keep it. And um, the fragility of the democracy is is paramount to the fragility of the planet, and you could probably argue intertwined. And um, I guess I think a little bit less about what success would look like and what representation might look like, what a conversation that um, is rooted in the values of the Declaration would look like. Um, and to actually kind of to your point, Christy, about the what 1776 meant and to whom and where. Um, the um, Growing up in Southern California, we got a dam painted with a big bicentennial flag on it. I remember that, which is, you could talk about the layered complexities of that, right, water in the West and having a dam claim for 1776, which meant nothing because, of course, that was when Juan Batista de Anza was trying to break through and find an inland route up from Sonora. Um, and so one of, I think, certainly historiographically, success would be a very kind of a global understanding of, of what that, that latter part of the 18th century might have meant. But I think to all of our points and, and going to Christie's, it has to have that um, kind of sense of, of, of relevance in that I'm hoping for a reinvestment in the civitas, to use the fancy word, um, into the common wheel, to the common good, which I think has been really complicatedly lacking. Um, I think that the way in which kind of citizen archivist um, co-curation, all of the words that we throw around um, in our profession can have really deep and rich meaning uh, if they are brought forth in ways that engage communities, that um, create agency within communities, and that tie history to real community needs of safe food, safe water, the, the stability that so many of us crave and that so many of us still don't have. Um, we just worked with the community in, um, in Tallahatchie, Mississippi to um, uh, co-curate an exhibition on one of the um, markers in which um, uh, marked the point in the Tallahatchie River where um, young Emmett Till's body was, was pulled up. Um, the community worked um, and this is because of the, and we only know the story of Emmett Till, of course, because of the black journalists who helped make sure that the nation, and then, of course, his incredible mother, um, uh, Mamie Till Mobley, making sure that we all uh, knew and understood. Um, but the use of history, and I think um, to gently just kind of go back, this, today is not the day that we start thinking about uh, the complexity of the Declaration um, people throughout time have um, thought about the complexity of, of the Declaration. And people throughout time have used history in ways that we, as public historians, could learn so much from. Um, almost all the great orators, um, African-American orators, many of the women orators who are fighting for women's rights, start with history. And so I think it's a very kind of grounded way. Um, so to go back to your question, so to honor your question, success would look like a grounding in history that kind of gives people that life force, gives them that animation to understand uh, their place um, and their rights um, in uh, the democracy if we can keep it. Thanks. Uh, Christy, why don't you go next and then Scott, if you'd like. <laughs> Um, success to me would look like coming to a conference about history and culture um, that is not necessarily ethnic specific like uh, a sala, but coming to a general conference and actually having the diversity of our nation and our scholars represented and our communities represented. That's what success would look like to me because it would mean for once, we are actually having a conversation with each other about our shared existence, even if we take time to look at them from a particular lens to gain greater insights. 
until that happens, I don't think we're successful. Um, and I'm not sure, and I'm, all, I'm constantly trying to figure out that particular puzzle. I'm constantly trying to figure out, um, and we all say it, we want greater diversity, we want this and that in our organizations, but we often are, don't really put in the work of what that means. Um, it's like, you know, you want to invite somebody into your house, but you refuse to step into theirs, right? Um, so I, I do think about it very differently. I am not thinking about how much money are we going to make or how many, you know, especially at Yorktown, because I got a little bit more time, <laughs> you know, with the American Revolution at Yorktown. <laughs> So I got a little bit of time to try to like figure this thing out, right? And um, <laughs> right, um, you know. But but in thinking about all of the barriers that, whether intentional or not, that that still prevent people from entering these spaces and feeling like they belong, you know, that's the that's the thing I'm desperately in every job I've been in trying to crack. You know, what? what is that? Because I can tell you that all of these people that in terms of our national nostalgic narrative about our founding and our past, all of these peoples of color and women and marginalized groups and all that, they are all having conversations about the meaning of the Declaration of Independence but they're not having them in the spaces where more often than not where you find money and access and resources. But the conversations are happening. And so I'm just trying to figure out what it looks like. To me, success looks like when I can bring all of those forces together in a space where everybody is exploring. Is that a you know, panacea, nirvana, happy little place. Um, I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen in spaces and places where you would not expect. But it's the ongoing nature of it that becomes far more difficult. Because it's so easy to step into those spaces, feel good in that moment, and think you've done the, the right and noble thing, and then you go right back to what you were doing before. And so I'm just trying to figure out what that consistency looks like and how to achieve that at a, at a really challenging place. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in that, you know, uh, because we have, you know, the Jamestown, the Jamestown settlement side of our organization, Paspahe and where I'm a and what have you, in terms of the, the Powhatan peoples that occupied this, this area and whose descendants are still in our region have a very different relationship with the founding of this nation. They have a very different relationship in thinking about um, how all of that came into being, which is really stunning. And you know, the conversations about, for them, is like you know, the, 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 the promises that were made and made and made and broken and broken and broken and broken and broken and broken right up to the pipelines out there in Dakotas, right? And then I have descendant African-American communities who are descendant communities from Yorktown who couldn't even be included in DAR or anything like that for the longest time, or the sons. But these are direct descendants on lands and then when the National Park Service federal government came into that area to make the parks, to create, the displacement was disproportionately African Americans lost land that they had been on since the revolution. And I am asked to figure out how to diversify. <laughs> and, but these are the things that we have to address, right? I mean, so that's why success that's why the reckoning, that's why the conversations, that's why the, for some, the, you know, for, to, the, to the 
Jews of Portuguese descent that came into that area, to the Spaniards who were there even before the English settled in the 1560s, to, to all of the people who have, again, conveniently been left out of the narrative, but whose descendants embrace words and find meaning in words to challenge that. To me, that's, that will be the success. And I, it may take me to my grave, <laughs> but to me, that's what would look like success. Can I ask you a question, Christy? Do you find hope in that space in which the, the, the words, the ideals, the values, the conversations that are not in the condoned spaces take place? Um, I, <laughs> I'm um, reading a lot about yeah, hope. Uh, so. Yeah, hope, yeah. hope, hope, yeah. hope, yeah. hope. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or love, as Baldwin would say. Uh, you know, where do you find in that space? I, I clearly do, because I keep doing this work. Yeah, there's, a, there's that. We're um, all kind of addicted. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, I keep at it. I mean, I, I, it breaks my heart when I go to places and I you know, here, you know, I could see all this fabulous work that's been done, and then I, I hear about some of the things that take place in workplaces or questions that visitors are still asking interpreters, particularly interpreters of color, and I just go, we did that 35 years ago, <laughs> right? Um, you literally did it. I literally did, did that 35 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> and, and so I, but yeah, I do, because I, I, we wouldn't be, the, and the reason why is as challenging as, as in, in the fits and starts that I've seen over the last 35 years, and yes, and being just a kiddo, right? Um, I have seen movement. And I acknowledge that there clearly has been movement or we wouldn't be having the conversation right now. So that gives me a level of, of hope that this work, the fact that we can actually say the words, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about just like, so we all know and love um, Gordon Wood, right? And so um, when Radicalism of the American Revolution came out, Everybody was like, oh my God, this is just the most amazing book and it's going to be great. And, and I read the book and I was taking copious notes, you know, and I was in grad school at the time, so I'm just like, go, 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 go. and I was still working full time and, oh you know, my God, just pencil marks everywhere and I had all these notes. And um, because here's the, here's the thing, at work they decided they were going to have a, a book talk, forgive me for taking up your time. Um, <laughs> But anyway, and I had all these notes and all these ideas from these other sources that as I was reading this book with him. And, and then I go to the book talk, you know, I, or, or to the, 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 it was supposed to be like a book club, right? So I'm going in there and there's, there's probably 20 of us sitting around the table and we start talking about the book. And, and I realize I'm the only one that's saying, well, wait a minute. The thesis starts falling apart when you do da, 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 da. And I'm just talking like, Whoa, and remember when I went from Jordan said this and don't never did it. And remember the video, and we look at Philip Vickers, you know, and I'm just go, rattling them off, right? And then there's this hand that goes up at the end of the table, and this older man sitting there. And he said, Well, that's interesting perspective. What's your name again? And I was like, Oh, Christy Coleman. He says, Hi, I'm Gordon Wood. <laughs> But what I loved about that, and I will never forget that exchange, is that he heard me. Now, he certainly got back to principally where he is, which is part of the reason why he's, you know, kind of adamant. Well, there's some other reasons related to that, but I won't get into that in a moment. But, you know, he, but he has, there, there is, I think, I don't think that there's anything wrong necessarily with taking pride in the accomplishment of the founders in creating this thing. Regardless of your one's background, I think that is absolutely right. 
haven't seen anything like this in the, you know, at that point, history of the planet, right? So amazing were these ideals that they influenced a, a global world in course and time. However, we would be, to, to stop there, as many often do, is to miss the point, is to miss the larger point. It's like stopping in that first paragraph of the Declaration and you're missing all that other stuff that's in there that we've been trying to clean up for 250 years. So I, 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 I cede my time. I love that you mentioned Gordon Wood because I should have also mentioned that the unfinished part is right from Eric Foner, right? Yes. That the mm -hmm. unfinished revolution, the right. unfinished, um, uh, and as he sees the reconstruction, the second reconstruction, um, and then of course many people calling out for a third reconstruction. So. This is great. I want to turn it over to the audience. Um, I do have one last one word question answer. Uh, one word. But nobody, because I've been struck. I, 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 I've been struck. I, I didn't know what anybody was going to say, especially with that first uh, question. And what I've heard um, is that the Declaration still has a lot of relevance and power, uh, perhaps to unite people together. Is that what you all believe? Yes. Maybe it's what we all hope. Hmm. How's that? Hmm. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> That's more than one word. <laughs> yes. I answer yes, and I'm offering you the, you could dial that back and say it has latent power that may not be realized. I certainly have hope. Um, do I believe it can be? Yes, I think to your point. Why would we be working so hard, right, if we didn't, all of us in this room, in our own ways, right? So. I, I do believe it can um, because it has withstood so much, but yet it does have such room uh, to be actualized. Sure. <laughs> right. Great. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> um, great. So we want to open it up to the audience. Uh, if you have questions, please raise your hand. I see uh, Mark Peterson. That's really high. Thanks. I'll hold it. Oh, okay. Good work. Uh, <laughs> be careful. It could get dangerous. Uh, <laughs> I thank you for your presentations, and I ask this as a very serious question. Following on what you've said in your several comments, which is, why do this at all then? That is, there's sort of two points to this. One, Declaration of Independence itself, produced by that committee in Philadelphia in 76, was not all that new. Right, it was modeled on the English Bill of Rights in its structure. The sentiments that were in it were in the Virginia Constitution passed just days before this at the time. As a statement of rights or a, a way of bolstering a greater degree of liberty for a wide range of people, it's an incredibly thin read, right? That there's not that much to it really. Secondly, independence Sure, in 1776, for some of Britain's beleaguered colonies, understandable, but we're talking today about a nation state with hundreds of overseas military bases, taking military action in countries around the world, whether we know it or not. A country that doesn't tolerate very well independent action by other countries around the world. So independence as a value to be trumpeted in connection to the United States in 2026? So I put both of those things forward and ask seriously the question, is this what historians really want to draw people's attention to right now? Or there are other ways to do the very important things that you all were talking about doing that doesn't further fetishize an 18th century document that really wasn't written to do these things and isn't a particularly strong way to go about doing it. The question. Well, that's just brilliant. <laughs> you get to take that. I'll take it. Um, this is going to be a hard thing for me to say to all of you, but it is possible to overestimate your ability to influence what people care about, what they find meaning in. No, I'm I'm serious about that. You know, I. 
a lot of that's the power of actually not detaching these conversations from the actual lived experience of the people in the period and beyond. Um, we're doing a big project right now uh, that'll lead to an exhibit about um, a character many of you will know, James Fortin, of course, um, a free African-American boy at the time, teenager at the time um, of all these events, and um, who leads an extraordinary life. And of course, you know, he recounts 50 years later, the power of being on the square caddy corner from where we're sitting and hearing the words of the declaration um, read and then leaving you know, a trail, not just of what he did, but what he thought and said and why he thought that was important. Um, so, I don't know, I would, I, I, would, I would say actually we should meet people where they are, which is actually they're arguing about it and that's actually a lot of things I hate about Twitter, and it's not a place to have subtle historiographical conversations. <laughs> but to have people like arguing over what it means is pretty cool, actually. And it's beyond just the Twitter historians. No offense, uh, but you know there is a bigger audience there. But I think, in, you know, in terms of our collective ability to direct people's like love and affection and everything, I mean we should have some humility about what impact we can actually have. It's my favorite movie is the Shawshank Redemption with that little rock hammer and that's oftentimes with the staff, I'll use that when they get a little frustrated with we're not moving along farther or ever, but you can actually, you can actually make a difference. It's just sometimes imperceptible um, movement, but anyway. Anyone else? I'd like just to say one thing, Bill, and your because your comments were were so articulate. Um, pointing to the empire, um, which I do think that the certainly I think as historians we would be remiss in not helping people understand the the complexity of this inheritance, right? Where we have come from the three little gunboats, one of them, the Philadelphia, you know, that sunken Lake Champlain, which happens to be at the museum, which is why I know it so well. It was craned into the museum, when, and then the museum was built around it. So it's hard for me to, you know, think about doing anything else but figuring it out. Um, but I, um, I do see 2026. It's also the 25th anniversary of 9-11. Uh, this course was the 20th year. You know, what in that year, and historians love and hate, and you know, Never mind the semi quincentennial, which we're trying to learn to say. Um, but you know, what in that moment then can can we um, can we truly reflect on? Can we um, can we elucidate into the many many complex layers of, of the nation at at, at two fifty, and then whose nation? And um, and you're right, the heliographic, you know, kind of that around that document is certainly um, has its own history. I think we all have to decide how much we're going to dive into helping people understand the construction of that and how that got to be one of the major points of, you know, the hegemonic progressive narrative. Um, or, you know, to some of our other points, the hammer, the conversations that we're, not, you know, not a part of but are very meaningful, you know, kind of where in lies our responsibility as historians. And I, th I think about that a lot. So, yeah, but it's a great you can get up here too. Question in the back. Uh, good evening. Um, with 2026 uh, fast approaching, right, um, and our nation as, as the state as which we find it to be right now, um, with the debates especially around history and even the significance around the Declaration of Independence, um, how can we problematize this conversation even further when it comes to the national debate about the significance of the Declaration of Independence. Because we cannot forget, even the man who wrote it um, was a slave owner who had children afterwards with his dead wife's half, you know, uh, dead wife slave who was uh, his, her half sister. So like, how do we wrestle with that and speak truth to that and power to that while at the same time, upholding it in a, in a, 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 I think, a partisan environment that really like is seeking to stifle that conversation and that debate. <laughs> um, 
I, I don't think I don't think we can have the conversation without it. Um, you know, and and I will say that it also makes me tired to hear people say, well, you know, it's presentism and you can't, you have, can't judge them on our morality today and wah, 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 wah. Um, it's, it's interesting. It is an interesting conundrum, right? I mean, but we also know that the conversations around some of the hypocrisies of the moment in that period were being noted in that period, right? Um, and so, you know, and the, and the steps that were taken, especially by the time we get to constitution building, right, to secure and to entrench slaveholding power and wealth, I mean, that, those things are sort of foundational. And so, until we have the conversation about it, and until we really understand those pieces, we can then choose what we will forgive or what we choose to change. I, I am pretty sure that the framers had no intention for this thing the last 250 years. Even though they put into place ways to change it, we immediately as a young nation put it into this, we put the whole thing into this model of deification, for lack of a better term, the untouchable, right? Knowing it was inherently flawed. Knowing at the time it was inherently flawed, but it was also something, again, that had not been seen yet. And when we did see it a second time and a few years later, it was rejected by the world. And I'm talking about Hades, the Haitian Revolution. It was a revolution of independence, but a slave state, slave, enslaved people taking their independence. And the world shut her down and has for the past 200 plus years, right? And so I think, that's what I'm saying, I think if we, if we really value the underlying meaning, because I'm telling you, it isn't people's enamoredness with the Declaration really isn't about what's in, in, written in it. Again, it's about what it's become. And, and, as, and if I am telling you, you've got to remember that History and heritage and culture and memory and meaning are different beasts. And if you think for one minute that just laying out the facts <laughs> is going to get somebody to see it and have a conversation about it, you're wrong. That's why I said at the beginning when they was asking how would I do an exhibit about this, I, you have to start where people are and help move them into a place to decide. But status quo is so easy, so much easier to maintain, you know, than it is to really question what could we, how, imagine what would happen if people actually said, what if we took the core things that we all collectively value here and created something else? Well, I won't live to see that. But that conversation, and there are, uh, there are pockets in the country where people are having that conversation in a really lovely way. And what I mean by that is they are, they're imagining a more perfect union, right? That to me, that's one of those hopeful pieces. What does a more perfect union look like? And we can't really have that conversation until we look at where we failed in the documents and in practice. I would like to give you hope, however, <laughs> that comes from the floor of a museum. And that is knowing that actually the fourth graders the fifth graders, the seventh graders, the eighth graders, the high school students are different than 
our generations. And spending time on the floor, actually going through, shadowing those school groups when they are confronted with hard questions and hard conversations. I mean, and I know this is the case with Christie's Museum. I know this is the case at the Smithsonian. I mean, there's, there's, nobody's hiding anything. Um, uh, Christy and I both have pretty recently opened museums that really draw from all the recent um, scholarship and I think emphasis on telling much more uh, diverse, um, you know, journeys through this period. And, um, you know, those kids can, I mean, I forget, my kids are in college now, so I forget the kind of sophisticated conversations you can have with fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh graders about about a lot of these issues. And um, I just want to tell one anecdote, which is an experience that I had in the museum shortly after we opened, but I think it, it capsul capsulizes what I'm talking about, if that's the word, capsulates. I didn't, encapsulates, that's it. I, didn't, I did not drink enough of this water. Um, but we, we opened the museum in April of 2017. And for those of you who visited, we have got a lot of big gilded statues, which became uh, of King George, and he gets suffers great indignity several times through the through the journey there. And as you may recall, in August of 2017, there was a very poignant moment in Charlottesville, location of my graduate study, and, um, that really brought that conversation about statues and and memory and history uh, to a to a a point. Obviously, it had been an issue for a long time. And so I was, as I often do, kind of wandering through the galleries, uh, trying to find a family or some young people to ask what they liked about the galleries. And I was in um, the very last gallery that's about the early republic. So it's actually, it was a family taking selfies in a replica of the Rising Sun chair, um, which they don't let you do in Independence Hall, but you can do at the Museum of the American Revolution. Uh, it's a really big chair, by the way. I mean, it even looks big on me. Um, and so the family I engaged was, um, mother was from Central America. The father was, you know, guy in his 30s, white military kind of guy with the haircut and everything. And, and so um, I asked their daughter, who's about 10, 11 years old, you know, what did you like about the, the, the museum visit so far? And usually kids will focus on an experience, you know, like the Liberty Tree or getting up on the privateer or something. Um, but she focused in on the story of the Declaration. And when you go through the museum, we have a little pocket theater. Um, we recreated the, the Windsor chairs from Independence Hall, again, so you can experience in all the ways Congress did what it's like to sit in one of those chairs. And there's a little short film that starts narrated by Abigail Adams about, I long to hear you have declared an independency, and then kind of takes you through the, the debates and discussion about how we end up um, with this with this document and rehearses the different arguments for and against and then the very next thing you see is this recreation three dimensions of the statue the equestrian statue of King George that was torn down in New York on July 9th of 1776 and so when I asked her what did you like she starts telling me in this very dramatic way uh, about what Congress is arguing, I thought this is a weird 10 year old because she, she was really in like, here's what John Dickinson said and you know, and a, a skiff of paper and like she had really listened in on this thing and it was dangerous and she, and then they decided to do it and they went for liberty and then she starts describing tearing that statue down. And so me, you know, Dr. Stevenson Museum Education thought, oh, I'm, here's a teaching moment. So I was like, well, does that make you think of anything that uh, your parents are talking about or that you're seeing on television thinking, oh, the statues, we're talking about Charlottesville and everything. And she looked at me and she said, yeah. But she did not go where I thought she'd go. She said, I was thinking that 100 years from now, someone's going to go to a museum about my time. And the very next thing she was going to see, she was going to walk down this wall where we've uh, recreated, backlit, beautiful projection of... Uh, 75 photographs from the revolutionary generation of people who were alive during the revolution. It includes, you know, Chainbreaker, a Seneca man who was a, you know, veteran of the Battle of Oriskany, and Isaac Granger Jefferson, born enslaved at Monticello in 1776. So it's a very diverse cast of real life people. And then the very last thing you see is a wall of mirrors that says, meet the future 
of the American Revolution. And I just, I could tell you, I could, we could sit here all night and particularly if I asked my staff who are sitting over here, they could share these kind of stories. So there's like the level of dialogue that we're having here this evening, which is really important and inspiring and, and thought provoking. But I also just want to report from the floor that I'm actually very hopeful because um, there's some really, the, the kind of conversations we're longing for adults to be having, which is really important, are actually happening um, in, those, in those classrooms. And I, I'm sure you probably see it as well in your, your institutions. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. Great. Yeah. That brings a lot of hope, though. Yeah, I think we all find that. Um, and then the ways in which they see themselves, mm -hmm. both reflected, um, but also empowered. That's, that's lovely. Yeah. Probably a lovely way to end. Well, we've got one, <laughs> we have a question from online. We want to make sure we get the online question, and uh, we then we'll wrap it up. Yep. <laughs> Hello, I, I'm the disembodied voice of the internet. Um, the question, question from one of our, yeah. hello, question from one of our fellows, uh, Molly Nebbiolo, who asks, um, who are the other actors in the history of the revolution that we should be teaching our students uh, besides the, the founding fathers? Uh, anyone specific who embodies our ideas about uh, what freedom means now and perhaps in five years? So. I guess that'll come in a while. Mm -hmm. Freedom means now and five years and the other characters. Well, so um, one of the things that I think, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think about, you know, I think about the Seneca and I think about, um, you know, I, I, I think about those who were caught up in the western part of the sort of the outskirts in French territory who were terrified that the English were coming and how that was going to impact their livelihoods and what they were doing. I think about, you know, we've talked, you know, ab about the African American community and, and other indigenous communities. Um, there was at one point even a conversation about a 14th colony before all of this, you know, to try to bring native nations into it um, to support. And of course, well, we know what happened. Um, so, you know, the, I, again, I think that the, the fiber of the story takes on extraordinary meaning during this time. Um, I think that the other narratives about choice of revolution versus uh, remaining, you know, we, we sort of vilify the Tories, right? In a lot of ways, we vilify Tories for choosing to remain loyal to the crown and what that looked like for them. Um, we talk about the 5,000 uh, free black men and enslaved men who would fight for the Continental uh, Army, but we don't talk about the 25 to 50,000 or more of African Americans who lay their lot with the British for offering them what they see as, you know, freedom for them. You know, what does that look like and how are they defining it? I mean, I think that there are, there are so many ways that we can explore it but again we've we've been so entrenched in terms of a singular narrative or so laser focused on one guy's sexuality and abuse or whatever you want to call it that we're we're missing the breadth of this story in that moment in time i think that's thank you so much i think that's really well said and it i think then it it does then I think leverage conversations about um, not to be trite about it, but the many 1776s, right? There's so much already in a very complicated geopolitical world in which contestations over uh, empire, contestations over ownership of other peoples, a legacy, you know, from the late 15th century, certainly of the ways in which Spain um, inaugurally and then many others followed in terms of the of hemispheric contestations, that there's, I think, such a richness um, that you can bring to the conversations um, that really do take it into a landscape in which we don't really recognize, you know? And I think that's really important for people is that the, the diversity of, of time and place um, was there, um, especially coming after the, the um, 
War in 17, uh, 1763. I mean, you think about all those alliances that were made and broken. And, and to your point about relevance for today, I think just asking people to think about the alliances they keep, the alliances they break, um, the ones that they have felt betrayed by, and, and really kind of getting uh, to that. I think all of us would love to see the, you know, the further diversification of, of stories, certainly, and of actors you know, in those times and of the choices made and of bringing forth, to your point earlier, the silences in the archives. Right. Because they're so there. Um, and I, I do, I will say this, we have to be mindful when we're talking about, she, she, she just said something that, that kind of triggered me, um, this idea of, you know, in our, in our desire to try to find diverse voices, we have to be really careful that we're actually hearing and actually searching for diverse voices. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes what we're really looking for is shading to support the narrative that we've already picked. Mm -hmm. And there is a difference. Yeah, it's not choosing other, other colors or crayons. Right, right. Cool beans. Yeah. <laughs> Great, well, thank you all uh, for this conversation. Thank you all for coming.